Hello, hello. Right. My real name's Tim Cockett. There we Sorry. go. Oh, no, don't worry. I get get all kinds. Um, unusual spelling, unusual name. Right. Well, I'm, I must say I'm very honoured to to be here. Uh, I came along to the previous one, which was my good friend Phil Catling, uh, which I thought was fascinating. And then at the end, they said, we're short of people to give talks. I thought, well, I could give a talk. And so I chatted to Phil and he encouraged me. So so here we are. Right. Um, well, OK. Um, I'm a retired gentleman, used to work in computing. I'm sure many of us have done that. Um, I'm a military historian by interest and world war one is a particular interest of mine and as you will see verdun is a particular special interest that i have so um i'd prepared this talk on warfare underground it was going to be a it was a 50 minute talk with a friend then talking about vietnam and the chu chi tunnels uh, so there's no mention of vietnam or the chu chi tunnels because my friend was going to do that um, so as soon as I got a prepared talk, chatted to Phil, and now you're going to get it, you lucky people. So what you're going to get is a, is a big, thick World War I sandwich, because I'm mostly going to talk about World War I and warfare underground in World War I. Uh, so there's a, 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 there's a bit of bread before, which is the preamble, a bit, bit of bread afterwards, which is post-World War I. So what are you going to get today, just to get you all excited? Um, look out for uh, petards. Uh, so I'm going to talk about petards. There's a Peaky Blinder in there. He fits rather well. Rather pleased with the Peaky Blinder. And there's even exploding cows. Who is this lunatic? Who let him into Subterranea Britannica? Ha ha! I've got you for the next hour or so. Um, some of these, some of the images I use are very much me indulging myself. Because any excuse to look at Vauban fortifications, um, especially if there's an aerial photograph, you'll be seeing that. Right, let's go. Um, so now, um, underground warfare, it's nothing new. It's nothing terribly new at all. Um, the Romans were involved in forms of, of underground warfare in the sense of um, tunneling under walls. We're going to be hearing a fair bit about tunneling under walls, but uh, even here, the Roman siege of Ambracia. Uh, so you can see there that the Romans dug under the wall in the hope of getting the wall to collapse. And there was even, the defenders even used a, an early form of chemical warfare, which is burning chicken feathers, hoping to siege the, to smoke the Romans out of the siege tunnels. So extraordinary. Um, so next slide. So uh, what we've got is um, another example here. This is uh, the Romans um, again trying to capture the town of, now I think it's Vei, V-E-I-I. -I. Uh, this is way back in 396 BC. And what they did here, it's kind of like, it's the, the underground version of the Trojan horse. So the Trojan horse, you get your people into the town through the, the subterfuge of a Trojan horse. In this case, the Romans dug through under and into the town of um, Vei. Uh, and once the tunnel was completed, they, they jumped out and then opened the gates and a whole load of Romans came bursting in. So the point I'm making here is basically th there's, there's very little new under the sun. And even the Romans were digging under walls to get into walls and so on. Um, they, they actually kind of dug as quickly as possible, taking shifts. So there was a continuous process, very much like we'll see in World War I. Right. This is Bodium Castle. Um, it's basically just there as an image of a medieval castle because I'm rapid, rapidly moving through to the medieval period because there's a bit of fortress warfare in medieval times that involves uh, attacking using underground routes. Um, so Bodium Castle is just there as a very pretty castle um, and so on. Of course, it's protected by a moat, so you, you'd have to dig way under the moat to get through on Bodium. But it's just there as a pretty picture. 
and there we have uh, a wonderful image uh, that I found on a Dorling Kindersley web page of siege warfare against a castle. Uh, you've got the guys at the bottom layer digging, trying to dig under the walls of the castle, and you've got the chaps above them. Um, so it could be boiling oil, it could be Greek fire, and I'm sure the guy with the, the big thing in his hand is actually trying to drop a stone, although it does rather look like an oversized potato to me. Moving on, here's a, an even better drawing of medieval siege works. So you can see they've got a, a protected kind of shed thing on the left. Uh, and so they're going in there, they're digging away, they're digging through their, um, it, it's basically mining, you, you people know all about this, it's all shored up with wood and so on. The idea is that you dig under the wall, you'll then dig a great big void under the wall, you'll shore it up until you're ready and then you'll collapse the whole thing. You'll probably set fire to the wood, that's usually how they did it. Uh, what you then hope is that there'll be a, a whole section of the wall will collapse and it'll make a hole in the wall or a, a breach. There we go. Um, and in you go and try to take the enemy f castle, town, fortification, what have you. Um, and this is all well and good um, until you get to gunpowder. So we're, here we have the Siege of Orléans in 1429. Um, and... Um, you can see the, the early appearance of gunpowder there. You've got the big cannon at the bottom. Uh, and even on the city walls, you can see there's a guy there with an early handgun. Uh, gunpowder uh, can be very powerful. And if you've got a rudimentary cannon, you can fire a, a big cannonball against walls and make a big hole. And it's a, it's a lot less effort than digging a great big long tunnel. So this is what medieval fortifications and are, are now got to contend with uh, artillery it changes warfare the, the castle is no longer as safe as it used to be so um that then gets me to petards this is just an excuse to tell you about petards really because i rather like petards what is a petard you, you might have all heard about petards but i'll just pretend that you haven't a petard, the idea is it's, it's a bit like a kind of oversized plant pot filled with explosive. And the idea is that you would use it to try to make a hole in a door or a wall, some weak point in the enemy's defense. You see a rather nice illustration at the bottom here where the chap has set up a tripod. Um, he's put the, the cone, which is filled with explosive. Uh, he's hooked. Uh, he's hooked that against the door he's lit the fuse he's running away like blazes the hope is that this will now explode and it will shatter the door and then of course you can race in to the um, to, to the castle to the town whatever so why do i have a thing about petards well one of my favorite phrases is to be hoist by your own petard i found this cartoon which i think is rather wonderful um, so just to explain, on the left-hand side, you've got this, this kind of bell-like um, device, metal device, full of gunpowder. The word petard comes from the Middle French, uh, and it's the same word as breaking wind. So mm. yeah. now, so there you have in the middle the petard, petardier needed to depart early, because if he fails to get away before the explosion, he is going to be hoisted. He's going to be lifted in the ground, from the ground by his own petard. So there we go. So if we ever have parties to go to again, you can say, oh, have you ever heard the expression hoist by your own petard? May I explain what it means to you? It's rather fun. There we go. And apparently that phrase is used in Hamlet by Shakespeare. So that might be your only literary reference tonight. Um, so I said I was going to indulge myself. Sébastien Le Prêtre de Vauban, apparently, or better known as Vauban, the Marshal of France. He was the guy employed by Louis XIV to construct fortifications. 
um, and he constructed some absolutely fabulous ones. So, so it's French fortifications. That's where we're going. We're going to get to Verdun, but we're going via Vauban. And this is this is just one photograph. There's so many I could have chosen, but this is a, a place called Bretagne. I think it's called Bretagne, somewhere near Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, and you can just see what a fabulous fort this is. It is designed to withstand artillery fire and so on. So you've got all these moats. Uh, you defend this with artillery. You're going to spend a long time trying to break into Bretagne or any of the other Vauban fortifications. Now, Louis XIV, uh, I'm sure you've heard of him, the Sun King, very successful French king. Uh, maybe you've watched the Versailles um, series on the telly, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, he's, he's, he's doing very well. He's, he's a lot of prestige, a lot of military success. So how do you show how successful you are? What kind of prestige um, monuments can you build to yourself? Well, he had Vauban and he decided he wanted lots of fortifications, lots of forts on the borders of France. Uh, and so uh, here we have some models. So on the left, Perpignan, uh, 1686, and other models there. Now, uh, Louis XIV was a very busy man, very busy at Versailles, uh, very busy um, going to bed with other people's wives and so on. Um, that's not just a rumor, that's fact. Um, and he didn't want to spe spend much time away from Versailles. He, well, he didn't trust his courtiers for one, probably with good reason. Um, and so he wasn't going to go around and enjoy and see all these forts that Vauban had made for him. So if the king's not going to go to the fortifications, well, you can make models of the fortifications to go to the king and he can then look at these models and say, oh, aren't these one? Oh, look at this one for Perpignan. Oh, well, very pleased with that. Oh, nice bit of double wall there. Nice moat, whatever. Um, you know, you must come and do that with the palace sometime. There's a Python reference for you. Um, and so, of course, the King of France is very busy. The King of France has got better things to do than remember his number. And so he had all these models made. And should you go to Paris, if we're ever allowed to go to travel again, if you go to um, the museum, the army museum, which is Les Envelides. You can go to the Museum of Relief Models. In French, it's the Musée des Plans Relief. Um, and it's brilliant. You've got to go up three flights of stairs, but there is a lift. Uh, and it's just full of these models, like absolutely brilliant. So um, when we get to travel again, I'm keen to go back to Paris and see this stuff. Right. Now, that gets us to World War One. So I'm just going to go back one. And Tony, shall we, shall we, that's, that's the first bit of bread in the, que in the, the questions. Uh, have we got any questions in the Q&A as yet? Uh, or shall we do, can, do we have questions? I don't see any. Oh, do the relief models have underground? <laughs> do they have, <laughs> excellent. <It's, laughs> that's Phil Cattling, isn't it? Yes. Um, I'm sure some of them do. Yes. <laughs> There, there are there are many, um, and if they haven't got one with a cutaway, I should email them and tell them to get one made so you can go see it, Phil. Bless you. There we go. Uh, they are brilliant models. Dear, dear. I think we'll crack up. Shall we, Tony? Shall we? Shall we move on to World yeah, War One? Let's carry on then. Yeah. Let's carry on. Carry on up the presentation. There we go. Right. Um, here we go. Uh, hang on. No, uh, hey, there we go. Right. Okie doke. Vimy Ridge. Here we go. Now, um, Phil Cattling, you've, you've heard of him. He was, he was having a bit of fun with me yesterday. Um, he's, he wanted to know if I knew about Norton Griffiths. Um, cause he caught me out there cause I didn't know about Norton Griffith. Uh, what an, in, what an interesting fellow. Um, he, uh, he was the British guy that proposed um, using mining operations because the uh, the Germans were ahead of us. The Germans started the war and could see the value of mining operations. I'll explain them in a, in a bit more detail very soon. 
Uh, and uh, Norton Griffiths, also known as Empire Jack, um, and just completely irrelevant, he was the uh, grandfather of Jeremy Thorpe. There we go, someone you've heard of. Um, he proposed that um, the British should use mining operations. Uh, wasn't initially received with enthusiasm, but they eventually saw the value of it. Uh, Norton Griffiths himself, a rather eccentric fellow, used to tour the trenches in a battered Rolls Royce loaded with crates of fine wine. That must be true. I got it from Wikipedia. Right. The Battle of Vimy Ridge, uh, which is April 1917. I'm starting here because it's a very good example of tunnels of underground warfare in a chalky region of the Western Front. So I'll move to the next slide. That's a, one of the, the many tunnels in the Vimy sector. Here we see a rather good map. I rather like this map because it shows the importance of Vimy Ridge. Now, I know you people love things underground, but in World War I, high ground was highly treasured, high, highly sought after. Uh, there's a photograph coming up of Hill 60. If you could have possession of any elevated bit of land, it gave you a better view of the enemy positions so that you could control your artillery. There's a huge amount of fighting to do with if I can hold the, the high ground, my artillery observers can sit on the high ground. They can see the enemy positions. They can see the fall of shot as the artillery shells are dropping in. Uh, and that gives us a big advantage. Uh, this is also really why aeroplanes were first used in World War I to spot for artillery. Now on the map here, uh, I'm moving my cursor along this, this red line here. That is the edge of the ridge. So Vimy Ridge is um, basically a, a steep drop. And prior to April 1917, the Germans had got this, were in possession of the ridge line. They were sitting on top of the ridge with a big drop behind them. Um, and they really didn't want the Allies to take control of that. If the Allies can take control of that, then they've got a tremendous view to the northeast, looking over the... Um, the plain around Lons, um, which is a rather flat area. And so they were they were dug in. They'd been fighting. The French had fought them. Then the Allies came in. The British had a turn. The, they put Canadians in. Canadians were generally very good at attacks. There's various reasons for that. Uh, so here you can see uh, one, two, three, four um, Canadian divisions ready to kick off on the 9th of, of April to take Vimy Ridge. And the, w the way they did this was that they dug lots of tunnels into the chalk so they could have men all queued up in the tunnels so that when, when it's time to go, they would send in the barrage against the, the, the front lines and um, they would uh, they, they'd then be able to kind of, in a sense, kind of burst out of the ground and overwhelm the Germans. That was that was the plan, and it worked pretty well at Vimy. So this photograph now is Vimy Ridge as it is today, and this is the huge monument to the Canadians. You see that white thing sticking up there. It's absolutely huge. Um, this is the ridge line. So, my, I presume Tony, can you actually see my cursor moving? I'm going moving it back and forth. Um, that's the line of, of the ridge. That's what the, the Canadians are going to push the Germans off. Um, uh, quick, quick point here. Um, yeah. Turn on your drawing at the top. Oh, right. Yeah, I've forgotten about that. Um, Move. Uh, no, I, I'll, I'll manage without. I'll just describe it. Just click um, your own picture on the right arrow and I'll move it across. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Ah, yes. There we go. Uh, drawing, yes. Excellent. Uh, hang on. Uh, that'll do. Yeah, there we go. That's that's the ridge line there. So the Germans are there. That X marks where the Germans are going to, um, that they want to push the Germans off the ridge onto the X position. And so what, what the Canadians have done 
is they've got a whole load of tunnels as we're coming up in this kind of area here like this um, and then after the event um, they've built this huge monument here very very important it was a tremendous victory for the allies um, there we go I'll just turn that off now uh, and it's the very first time that a colony so Canada has beaten a major European tower so it's a huge thing it's, it's quite important in the the national story of Canada. So we'll move on. Um, hopefully this will be very familiar to you. Um, this is tunneling in World War One. It looks a little bit like part of the, the Great Escape film, doesn't it? So um, the, the, the classic stuff, um, you've got a little railway to take away the, the debris. You're shoring up the sides of the tunnel. Uh, notice in the middle of the picture there's a canary just in case there's there's gas the canary will warn you that there's gas or well, hopefully it'll warn you before it expires um, and this is the clay kicking method so you can see in the bottom right the the pictures there um, the guy is leaning on his back and putting a shovel into the the face of uh, chalk or whatever it is and this is the, the, the classic method of digging tunnels in World War I. Uh, it's probably all old hat to you people because you like things underground, but uh, it's fairly new to me. Um, next slide. So this is the World War I version of what we saw earlier uh, as a medieval version, mining operations. You see the, the Allies are busy digging a tunnel here to get under the German trenches, under the German positions, under the German forts. And when they've uh, completed their tunnel, and you've got to be very careful to dig the tunnel the right place and be sure to stack your explosive underneath the German position and not 10 yards short or 10 yards long, um, they're going to, to fill this chamber, so they'll make a big chamber at the end, a fill it full of explosive uh, ammonal was the explosive of choice and uh, you'll get a, a big hole in the german position we're going to see more of that very soon um, however there's counter mining here you see the germans digging a tunnel so what they're trying to do is they're trying to intercept the allied tunnel and then destroy the, the allied tunnel before it can be completed uh, and you can see in this drawing, there's a, an officer with, um, it, it, it's the same as a, a stethoscope, it's the same technology, uh, up against the, the wall of the tunnel, listening for the enemy. Um, and we have here a photograph of a French engineering officer, and he's doing the same thing. He's got a, he's got a special microphone, very delicate operation, this is 1917. He's listening very carefully to, to, to see if he can hear the chip, chip, chip of the Germans trying to dig towards him. Now, I did promise you a Peaky Blinder. So here's the Peaky Blinder. Um, Thomas Shelby, if you, I'm sure many of you will have seen this. I started watching the Peaky Blinders and I discovered it. The, the central characters have been away on the Western Front and served in France. And many of the men were traumatized, um, and a lot of the um, uh, a, a lot of the uh, storyline is to do with how these men are trying to adjust to ordinary regular life and struggling to do that. Uh, so Thomas Shelby, who of course is is the central heroic character, the yeah. one that all the ladies fall for. Um, he struggles to sleep at night because he has a recurring nightmare of being involved in tunneling. And in his re recurrent nightmares, he remembers that suddenly the Germans burst through and attacked them. And it was horrible. And he, he was nearly killed and his friend was killed. And so he lies awake at night um, expecting a German to burst through the wall in front of him. Uh, so he takes heroin to help him sleep. Well, that's that's his excuse so there we go the um the peaky blinders connects into underground mining and there we have 
possibly the most famous explosion, the mine explosion of World War One. Uh, it's the Battle of the Somme. It's the mine beneath the Hawthorne Redoubt, uh, which was blown ten minutes before the, the the men went over the top for the um, on the first day of the Somme. Well, famously, sixty thousand casualties, close to twenty thousand British soldiers died that day. Perhaps. It would have helped if this explosion hadn't gone off 10 minutes early. Um, for some reason, this went off at 7.20 uh, and the attack went in at 7.30. So the Germans had 10 minutes warning that this attack that had been brewing was, was coming right then. But there we go. That's, that's the result of mining. And that's a jolly big hole at the Hawthorne Redoubt. But we're not short of big holes, big mine craters on the Western Front the result of underground underground activities so we hear a uh, picture here of the battle of the somme and i've put that there so you see right in the middle the loch nagar mine you see a big explosion in the loch nagar mine and you see the units who were going to attack uh, very soon after that mine had been blown if you now go and visit the western front and i've had a few visits to the western front this is the loch nagar crater you can see there's a, at, at the top there, there's a cross and people standing around the cross. And that just gives you some idea of scale. Gosh, this is big. That was one explosion. Gracious me. Um, so when you talk about World War I and uh, soldiers with no known grave, well, some of them just got atomized on big explosions like that. Uh, now, for you underground enthusiasts um, the glory hole is very near to the Loch Nagar crater it's like you know, three minute walk away and there was major excavations there in 2011 uh, and the World War One archaeologists were very keen very pleased to, to, to get access to this site they knew that they would find the bodies of at least 28 British tunnelers because in the various activities, those people had got entombed in there. Uh, of course, there's so many people killed on the Western Front that basically if you put a spade into the ground, you're quite likely to find human remains if you start digging to, uh, any, uh, 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 if your excavations are any size. Um, so you can see there, uh, there's craters uh, in the top picture. Uh, German trenches in blue, British trenches in red. Um, now, the the big event for exploding of mines is part of uh, what you might know as the, the Third Battle of Ypres, or Ypres, Wipers as the British called it, because uh, British soldiers couldn't say words like Ypres, or um, there's a, a town somewhere near here called uh, so they called it White Sheet. And uh, at the bottom, Plug Street Wood. They call that Plug Street Wood. Um, anyway, part of the preparation for the Battle of Messines, uh, which kicks off on the 7th of June 1917, is that there are 25 mines laid. You can see there uh, nearly 1.2 million pounds of explosive. So uh, anyone who was selling Amonal to the British Army was doing quite well here you can see there that on the day they only actually exploded 19 of them and um, so there were six not exploded and you see the line of this so all those mines go up and uh, there's you know, the Germans are kind of well more than surprised uh, certainly more than just a bit upset um, right at the top notice there's one that's called Hill 60 um, right in the north. We're going to see a picture of Hill 60 in a moment, or at least a memorial at Hill 60. So six mines weren't exploded. Various reasons for that. One simple one is that two of the mines had been dug and were, were ready, but then above ground, the British had actually taken that area. So you weren't going to explode those mines because you'd blow up your own soldiers. Now, uh, that means that we've now got six mines unexploded. And once you put that amount of 
explosive under the ground, it's it's not a, it's not a good idea to try and take it out again. It's going to be unstable. Someone's going to get caught in the explosion. Um, and over time, uh, one mine, one mine has certainly been uh, uh, exploded as a result of a thunderstorm, uh, and that was on farm area. And uh, I understand that the, the local farmer lost at least one cow in that explosion. So uh, I'm I'm a board game. I'm a war game. I'm a board game. Would you believe there is a board game called Unexploded Cow? Astonishing. Uh, produced by a company called Cheapass, who do very entertaining games. Um, this came out around the time of the um, of the foot and mouth disease epidemic in Britain. I'm sure you'll remember that, where Britain had lots of cows that needed to be slaughtered because they they become infected. Um, and the idea that Cheapass had was maybe we could do a game talking about how do you set off these unexploded mines on the Western Front. And maybe you can do that um, with uh, expendable cows. So the game involves various cards with, with cows on um, and you choose which cow is going to set off which mine and you roll the dice to see if it's successful or not and score points. They are a bit weird, but there we go. Can you believe it? Right. Well, if you found that entertaining. Um, now, there's <laughs> a little bit of explanation behind this photograph. This is, this is me uh, fairly recently, and this is Hill 60. This is the memorial to the Australian tunnelling unit at Hill 60. Now, it's called Hill 60 because at the start of the war, it was 60 metres above sea level. By the end of the war, it wasn't 60 metres. It was a bit lower down because it was occupied by the Germans, then the British, then the Germans, various mining operations blowing the top off it each time. Um, and here, here we are at Hill 60, uh, very interesting place. Um, look forward to going there again. Now, why am I pointing at the memorial and a hole in the memorial and looking very pleased? Well, there's a little bit of background. It'll take a minute, but I think it's worth it. Um, in 2010, I was very fortunate to go to Gettysburg in america and we had an amazing six hour tour of the gettysburg battlefield and we were all enthusiasts and the guide loved it and he, he's really enjoying himself and i said to the guide uh do people ask you any stupid questions when they come on to you know the general public who don't know as much about the american civil war as as this lot do now very quickly um americans are very keen to preserve their written heritage um, and so uh, as many battlefields in the american civil war are now protected um, as uh, national parks and so he said oh you, you wouldn't believe the daft questions that people ask I said, well we'll try he said well the first one is all these monuments on the gettysburg battlefield he's covered in monuments all these monuments where do you put them for safekeeping in the winter well, you know, just leave them there you know they're stone monuments okay right okay um then uh isn't isn't it extraordinary isn't just very very strange that the only place they ever fought battles in the american civil war was in national parks hmm yeah well maybe there's a kind of causative link there but then my most favorite one was uh, people people say to the the tour guide these these monuments this is the exact place where such a such a unit was and so on. yeah that's right how come there's no bullet holes in the monuments so there we have a monument with a bullet hole in it on Hill 60 because the monument went up after World War One, but then World War Two came through as well and there's bullet holes on the monument. There we go. I hope you enjoyed that. Right, here's an informatic. Aren't informatics brilliant? This is the, the Battle of Messine Ridge. Uh, there you go, lots of tunnels. I hope you like lots of tunnels. You see the, 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 the mine being successfully exploded there under the German trenches. Uh, this was one of the, this was the, the biggest man-made noise in history to that date. Um, and you can see the, the little picture in the bottom right there of the, the sound wave. It is said that the, the uh, number 10 Downing Street, the teacups rattled on the shelves when they, the, the sound wave of this explosion going off. Um, now, mention counter mining 
I was rather pleased to find this uh, picture on the internet. Uh, this is Spanbroek Merlin. It's one of the biggest um, mines on the Messine Ridge. And you can see here the, the big long, uh, going from the bottom left to the top right, the big long tunnel that the British dug. And you can see there that the Germans are, are trying to countermine. They're trying to guess where that tunnel is to interrupt it. Uh, I, I love the way they've enabled these. So Ewald, Elsa and Frieda as the names of the German countermines. Um, Spamber at Merlin, the mine was in position and it was blown for the Battle of Messine. So, um, we now get to the French and this gets us to Verdun in a few slides. Now, um, we, we just need to kind of wind the clock back a little bit to 1870-71 where there was a war, it's called the Franco-Prussian War, where Bismarck did rather well. The, 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 the Germans declared war on France. They had a, a big push west. They defeated the French in no short order. And on the back of this, Bismarck then unifies Germany. And so Germany, modern Germany is born in 1871. Um, and uh, the French are a bit put out because the Germans take bits of land from, from them. So the two states of Alsace and Lorraine, Alsace Lorraine are taken from the French by the Germans. Remember those names, they, they reappear in a moment. So, the, so once it's settled down, the French scratch their heads and say, we don't want the Germans invading again. So how do we protect ourselves? Well, let's build a line of fortifications. And the guy that oversees this is Serre de Riviere. Uh, so there he is in 1882. And a whole series of forts are built. So the Serre de Riviere fortifications. This particular one is the Fort of Bois-Boru, so the fort in the Boru woods. This is west of Verdun. You'll see it soon in a, on a map. Uh, and this is how they were built. So these are Fortifications, 1880s date fortifications, 1881 this was first built. And you can see there's, there's, there's barracks, there'll be firing positions, there's dry moats and so on. But it's open to the air. Because at that stage, artillery, this, this could just about cope with artillery of the time. However, 1870s through to 1900, there are extraordinary technological improvements in artillery. We're just going to do this largely from the French side of things, and it does get to things going underground in a moment, so bear with me. Uh, paradigm shifts in artillery, rifling the barrel, so putting a spin on the shells, they're more accurate. Breech loading, loading at the back of the cannon. You can see here a 155 millimeter gun, um, and you can see the, the mechanism at the back for loading the shell at the back. That's a huge improvement against putting gunpowder down the barrel and loading a cannonball. Uh, the, the guy who designed this, you see his picture there, Charles Rangon de Bang. What a brilliant name for someone who designs artillery pieces. And also you, you can increase the range of artillery so you can be firing your shells from way beyond the range of infantry rifles. That's a big help. There's also developments in explosives. So it's not just the, the guns. The explosives are getting better. We, we hear, see a fellow, Eugene Turpin, working in his library. He invented something called melinite, which is much more powerful. You've got something like three or four times as much explosive power with melinite as you have with previous explosives. So effectively, come 1885, all your previous guns are now obsolete because guns can be, be more powerful. New guns can be more powerful. So the French were slightly ahead. The Germans weren't far behind. And of course, the British weren't far behind either. In order to trial this artillery, the um, French um, picked on one of their um, fortifications. Uh, this is Fort Malmaison. If you speak French, Malmaison 
bad house. Well, it certainly was after they'd done some target practice. Uh, so the French selected this fort to see how effective the new artillery fire would be against it. And they were absolutely astonished as to how destructive the new shells were. They were horrified with the power that they had unleashed. Um, right. And uh, so Malmaison was, they still used the rubble. They defended the rubble in World War One. Very famous French gun here, the 75mm, uh, the Soissons cans. Um, quick firing artillery piece and the, I've, I've included it to show this is a gun with recoil so when you fire the gun you know, this is all I, I, I don't, you know, basic physics isn't it you, you have a, uh, every action has a, a reaction so you'd fire the gun so there'd be a big explosion but then the, the gun would want to kick back which is a bit of a pain if you spent hours aiming it in the right place with the recoil mechanism, that um, action, that energy is then taken within the gun and the gun barely moves at all. And the, the French 75 millimeter gun was a brilliant gun, one of the best artillery pieces available to any army in World War One. Um, right, you get there, Tim, finally. Thank you for your patience. We're going underground at last. This is Fort Douaumont in Verdun. This is the central fort. This is the biggest fort in the defensive line at Verdun. This is high ground above the town of Verdun, which is on the River Meuse. And uh, this is a fortification in the style of Serre de Riviere. Um, and what's happened, you can see, is that the French have realized they needed to bury their forts. They needed the forts to go underground. So what they've done is they've um, they've uh, covered the the fort with concrete and layers of dirt and so on. So there's now the the fort is quite a way buried for its protection. We'll, we'll see more of this. Uh, this photograph is from the rear of the fort. There's a, an underground entrance behind there. Um, and uh, this will all make a bit more sense in a moment. There's the Battle of Verdun. I'm not going to go into any detail, uh, but you can see that it kicked off on the 21st of February. It finishes um, in November, December. Uh, and in all that time, um, the Germans make no more than about four kilometers progress and then get pushed back at the end of all that. But Dormont is in the middle. Uh, as Tony has advised me, I'm just going to turn on my. Uh, to, there's Fort Dormont there in the centre of the French position. There's also Fort Vaux there, and all this land here, this is all high ground above the town of Verdun. There's also some high ground over here as well. The battle starts off on the east side of the Meuse, and then eventually goes over to the west. On the east side. You have all these um, various forts that have basically been buried. Um, so let's have a look at some big artillery guns. Uh, so we're looking now at um, the the German, the Long Max, 380 millimeter caliber. So 380 is the di the diameter of the shell. So that's what's it? Uh, one foot four inches in old money. These are railway guns. You have to bring them in on the railway because they're so heavy. Uh, so there's a German one. Uh, there's a French 370 millimeter howitzer. Uh, you can see if you look to the right of the gun, they actually need a hoist to be able to manage to lift the, the shells to load them into the howitzer. Uh, there's bigger guns still. Here we have a planned diagram of Fort Douaumont. So the, the central area is um, various barrack rooms, accommodation for soldiers. Uh, there's machine gun posts to defend it. And there's gun positions as well so for 75 millimeter guns. And then the, the bigger gun battery, which is on the top right here. Um, 
there's a photograph of a, of a rather young me when there was still some brown color in my hair and i'm sitting on the top of uh, fort duomont uh, next to the one of the pop-up turrets you can see a pop-up turret on the right of the, the picture there and this is this is inside so this is the gun for the the big guns there which is a, a double 155 millimeter gun uh, and there's the internal mechanism to lift the gun up to fire it and then it can drop down again um, so and there we have for uh, let me just check what the next line is. yeah um, there we have um, a, a cross section there we go Phil will be pleased there's a cross section there there'll be a model somewhere um, so you can see that all this fort has been buried and there's um, so the, the enemy is to, to the left here and the, the friendly side is to the right. Um, and we'll just very quickly explain that the Germans took this very early in the battle, um, almost by mistake. It was, it was just extraordinary. Um, the, the French had thought Verdun was going to be a quiet sector. And so they'd not defended it terribly well. They'd actually taken some of the guns out of the forts because they needed them elsewhere. So on the opening days of the Battle of Verdun, which turns out to be the longest um, battle in World War I, longest continuous battle, um, what happened was there was a German patrol uh, led by a sergeant who were meant to be kind of going forward. Uh, and they were meant to be going um, behind the German artillery barrage. But somehow things went wrong. They got in front of their artillery barrage they sent up flares. The artillery couldn't see the flares or didn't respond to them. And so these guys were in danger of getting shot up by their own artillery. So if it wasn't safe to go backwards, they went forwards. They went forwards and they spotted this fort, Fort Duermont. And they thought, this is very strange. There's, there's a gun firing at the top, but there seems to be very, very little other activity. There's maybe only about 20 Frenchmen in the fort. So what they did was they crept up on the fort, they dropped into the di dry moat, they could see that there was a machine gun position uh, which wasn't defended, so they form a human pyramid. It's, it's, it's like a circus act, it's a pantomime experience. And the sergeant and a few of the guys go in there with their weapons and walk around the corridors looking for, the, for, for a French officer so they can um, uh, point their guns at him and say, we're taking over the fort. So Fort Duermont fell early on um, almost by accident. It's quite extraordinary. Um, the, the Germans were thrilled to bits. It was all over the German newspapers. The French were horrified. This was the big defensive kingpin, if you would, of the Verdun defences. And the Germans have taken it in no, no short order at all. So uh, French weren't very happy. So there's Duermont. Uh, the, the, the picture on the left is Duermont early on in the war and you can see that there's a few shell holes and then the second photograph on the right you can see tremendously pitted with shell holes. It's been under continuous bombardment for months and months and months. The French do eventually take it back. Uh, this I thought was absolutely brilliant. This is a Dutch cartoon showing the different attitudes to fortifications. Uh, so on the left, we see what the, the, the Dutch cartoonist thought. This is how the Germans would set up Fort Duermont. It would be a good, solid thing bristling with guns. And on the right, this is what the French thought of their forts. It should be a lovely little chateau with a nice moat, with a few ducks, and so on. And uh, you know, you just pop out to the, the vinery and uh, bring, the, bring in the grapes to make wine, and so on. Um, I rather like that. Um, so... Dormont. Dormont is occupied by the Germans for months and they, the French just can't get in. They attack it over and over again. They eventually, they've developed even bigger guns and they bring up two railway guns. They're super heavy guns. They're 400 millimeter caliber guns. So that's 16 inch diameter shells. Uh, and what do they call them? They call them Alsace and Lorraine. They name them after those French 
uh, provinces that they want to take back from the Germans. The range is 13 kilometers, about eight miles away. So they're firing at a distance of about eight miles in against Fort Duermont. Um, they could actually shoot up to 10 miles. Uh, I think this is interesting, This, this di the diagram above the photograph showing that they actually had to dig a pit under the railway line for the recoil on the gun. So that the French start shelling Fort Duermont and the shells begin to penetrate the top of the of the, the fort, the carapace if you will, and the Germans evacuate. And so the French then move in and retake Verdun. So when the Verdun is first taken by the Germans, very few Germans take it. Uh, and then when the French take it back again, there's very few Germans inside. It's quite extraordinary. But a horrible fighting. A lot of men died trying to take Verdun. Now, uh, maybe a mile or so to the southeast of uh, Dormont is um, Fort Vaux, V-A-U-X. Here's Fort Vaux. Again, this is looking from the friendly side, if you will. There's the back wall. There's an underground entrance to the left uh, and a dry moat. Uh, this is underground warfare. Um, the Germans develop trenches. They The fighting progresses and they, they pick a day to attack Fort Vaux. Here we see a plan of Vaux. It's smaller than Duermont. You can see, again, barracks inside, uh, gun positions, uh, dry moat, and the dry moat is defended by machine gun posts. Um, and you see here this picture of uh, the German trenches uh, getting close to, to Fort Vaux so that on the, on the, the day of the big attack, after all the bombardment, the Germans are going to go in. Uh, this picture is an attempt to show what the, the, the very damaged fort of Vaux might have looked like. Um, and what happens is that the, the Germans eventually get in. They basically swarm all over it. Any, any entrance to the uh, open to the air, any air vent, they're going to be dropping grenades in. They're going to be dropping smoke in. Uh, they actually b break into the fort and they're fighting through the tunnels and uh, the next picture is of the fighting actually in the tunnels uh, and I think this is extraordinary you see the Germans are wearing gas masks because you know they can use gas in the confined space uh, they've got stick bombs they've got rifles but the the nastiest bit of kit here gentleman on the left he's got a flamethrower you can see the flame there I would not want to be a French soldier on the receiving end of the flamethrower. Very nasty fighting for Fort Vaux. Uh, eventually, the French have to concede because they've run out of water. The problem was that they thought they had enough water for a few more days, um, but the gauge on the cistern was broke. So they had very, very little water left. And they just they just couldn't hold any longer. Uh, so what happened was they uh, they finally decided that, that they would have to surrender to the Germans. Um, famously, uh, the last living French um, creature to escape the the fort before surrender was a pigeon. They sent a pigeon with a message round its leg: "We're out of water. We've got to surrender." The pigeon flies away to. Um, French headquarters, delivers its message and of course promptly expires. So when you go to Fort Vaux, you, you know, there, there's a, a stuffed pigeon and a big tableau saying how wonderful the pigeon is and so on. The French equivalent of the, De is it the Deakin Medal, whatever. Uh, anyway, that photograph is um, after Vaux has been retaken, this is the French reoccupying um, the Fort of Vaux. And then we have some modern scars of, of battle. If you go to Vaux now, this is the kind of debris you can see above ground. You just see the thickness there of the, the metal, the steel armor uh, of the turrets of Vaux. Um, now, Tony, we'll, we'll have a think. Do we want to take World War I questions now or shall I just 
crack on. We've got about another 12 slides to go. What do you think? Crack on now, yeah? Crack on. Right. Okay. So here's the link. Maginot. You've heard the name Maginot. So World War One is it's all over. It's absolutely horrible. And the French think, oh, what? We, we weren't happy when the Germans came through in the battle of uh, in the Franco-Prussian War. At least now we've got Alsace and Lorraine back. So it's not just the names of big artillery pieces. And they think, well, they, 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 we can't trust the Germans. They might attack us again. And so they have a thing. How can we defend France? And the, the minister in, in, in charge of defense is Maginot. Also remember, the French have taken huge losses. This is one of the reasons why the French um, are, um, are beaten very quickly by the Germans in 1940. They just didn't have the manpower. They'd lost so many men. Uh, they hadn't, re hadn't been able to replace them. Um, so Maginot comes up with this bright idea. They say, well, remember those forts that we had at Verdun? Remember how many of our men died trying to retake um, Dormont and Vaux and the, the many other forts? Let's defend France. Let's defend the French borders with fortifications. Let's build the Maginot Line. Yes, bright idea. Good idea. It's where you put your French money when there's an economic depression coming. But you can see here, going from the Swiss border next to Basel, they've got a nice big strong line of strong fortifications all the way past Strasbourg. They were hanger left. Here we go. All right. All right. There's Luxembourg. Hang on. Hang on. We've now got to the Belgian border. We're building a strong defensive line between us and what we consider to be the enemy. But Belgium is our friend. We can't really build a big, strong Maginot line along the border between France and Belgium. It's just shown that the Belgians, that we don't care about them. So there were fortifications, but they were weaker. And as I'm sure you'll know, what happens in World War II, those sneaky Germans, they come around and they don't attack the Maginot line because they'll just take a lot of damage. They go around, they, they do a big flanking right hook maneuver, just like they did in World War One, and they come in across the border around the Maginot line. The Maginot line was a very impressive bit of fortification. Um, there's a picture from 1939 of the, the Highland Division marching over a drawbridge. And that, to me, looks rather similar to what we saw in World War One. Um, I think this diagram is maybe a little fanciful, but it's meant to show what the, the Maginot line was like or what it could be like. Uh, look at that for an amazing bit of underground um, real estate. Absolutely amazing. And there are places that you can visit on the Maginot line yourselves. Um, I've only seen one little section of the Maginot Line. We were on the way to Verdun. There was a roadblock. We took a left turn and we ended up finding the Fort of La Ferte, which is the very last um, fort on the Maginot Line, which was actually attacked by the Germans and they swamped it and it, it was horrible. Um, so next slide, uh, we get to the UK. Uh, underground warfare in the UK during World War II. And... Um, so we have five major underground bunkers. Um, Dover, very impressive. We've got tunnels in the chalk in Dover, going back to Napoleonic times. And, uh, of course, come World War II, uh, Churchill and the, the government uh, decide that, well, you, we can make really good use of these tunnels and dig some more. So very impressive. If you go and visit Dover Castle, do give yourself time to go and look in some of the underground um places there as well and there is just an attempt to show three levels at top left three levels of tunnels under dover castle and the cross section there as well absolutely amazing very extensive and that they've opened them up as uh, as places that you can visit so when we get to visit places again be sure that dover castle is on your list you've probably been already uh, now, I, I heard a talk about Zossen the other day, it was bit Phil Cattling, whoever he is. Um, fascinating stuff. Uh, you've probably heard the talk. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Um, location uh, that the Germans made use of in World War One, then in World War Two, 
they build a whole load of bunkers uh, and we see here the construction um, which looks like a house above ground this is the Maybach side of thing the next diagram I got an outline there of these kind of 12 constructions that look like houses from above so it looks like a regular local village but actually underneath those houses a whole complex of underground tunnels and bunkers controlling uh, German telephony and so on and as well as Maybach there's a whole load of further tunnels uh, labeled Zeppelin off to the, the left in that diagram so we'll get through now just to, to modern times and the Cold War um, there's a, a rather nice diagram of the UK's nuclear bunkers um, I'm a big fan of the the bunker at Hack Green uh, in Nantwich I just think it's highly amusing that you drive around Cheshire and there's signs saying secret nuclear bunker this way it's not very secret if there's a big brown sign but there we go they, they do some amazing stuff there and there is a big bunker uh, well there was a big bunker there's a lot of tunnels underneath Manchester you probably know all about this but um, there we have the entrance to the Guardian Exchange uh, now this was a key location for British telecom engineers and in my previous job I occasionally talked to BT engineers and they talked about going down these tunnels um, so um, here we have the the central access position in back George Street I think yes George Street there we go uh, but these tunnels are quite extensive and there's one diagram showing some of the tunnels under Manchester uh, quite extensive um, GUT Guardian Underground Tunnel um, whatever the E stands for uh, exchange and there's the central area there of tunnels they were meant to be um, they're meant to be secret uh, I've heard that the uh, in order to keep them secret there was a lot of Polish labor employed because of course if, if this if all the digging is done by Polish people English most English people don't speak Polish so it'll be a secret I think there's a bit of a flaw there because Polish people can learn to speak English and share the secrets um, anyway regrettably you can't see these at the moment there was a tour uh, New Manchester walks did a tour of the um, the underground bunker but health and safety have stopped it happening and of course COVID stops everything uh, and here we go the final slide so the final slide is just um, a picture of, of Vimy Ridge the ghost of Vimy Ridge so going back to World War one and that Canadian monument so there we go that's the end of the slides uh, Tony what should we do now do you want to read some questions out to me and I'll see if I can answer them shall I stop sharing slides or, or, or what do you want me big on the picture or um, should we leave the slides up and then we might just go back to one or two actually the only question we've got so far is about the American Civil War not sure really yeah I don't know if you, can you actually <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen the film Cold Mountain um, but there was the Battle of the crater uh off the top of my head i'm going to say petersburg um there we go yeah um the whole thing about craters is it's a bright idea to put a big lump of explosive underneath the enemy and then explode it because you get a big hole in the enemy lines but then you've got to rush forward and then take control of the crater and you've got this massive big hole remember the photograph of the Loch Nagar crater these things are not easy to defend you know, you've got well now you've got big steep slopes on stable ground but if the if the crater just been newly blown it's uh, it's it's hard to um, hard to control it and there's Phil bless you Guardian bunker bunker still top secret where the internet lives uh, yes but the whole thing about the internet is there's lots and lots of routes and so on. Skyliner tours have an excellent above ground tour of the entrances. Oh, very good. And I can, I know where the entrances are as well. So you can do it on the cheap. Come and talk to me sometime when we can walk around. So 
Maybe Tony needs to think of a question. <laughs> no, I think uh, <laughs> I think if anybody has got no more questions, I think we'll uh, we'll go and have a drink. Oh, hang on, Hillary Shaw. Sure. There was uh, there was some stuff in the chat. Uh, so John Shipman talking about going to Vimy with his young family underground tour. Yeah, now Vimy. Let me let me comment on that. Vimy is really worth going to because. Um, the, the Canadians are very proud of Vimy, and rightly so. It, the, the, the Vimy area is ground that the French have given to the Canadians. And so a lot of young Canadians go and spend um, a, uh, a year uh, basically at Vimy doing guided talks, uh, gu guided walks through the tunnel. So I, I'm sorry, John, that uh, you, you, were, um, you were with the ones that were doing a French tour, but I could see that, you know, that they can, they do tours in French or in English. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there we go. Um, All right. Well, we've got yeah. a question from Hillary Shaw. All right. Okay. I'll let you see that one. It's a, uh... okay. Didn't the French railway system hinder them in world war one? franco prussia was all centralized on Paris. Also bottleneck for some, right. German railways were more decentralized, more... Oh, right, yeah, that, that's a very good point. World War I, when you start reading books about World War I and stop bothering to watch 30-minute documentaries on the telly, um, you realize that World War I is all about logistics. It's all about getting huge numbers of men and munitions and weapons and artillery pieces, artillery shells and food to a particular location to do a big attack, continuing to supply them and as the attack goes in, to continue to supply that. So the railways are absolutely key to World War I. Uh, and certain certain battles were for control of railway junctions. Um, and what the Allies, well, what both sides would do is they would, they would have the established railways and then there's a whole business of developing light railways to get the the materials from the um, from the railheads forward to the forward positions and so on, um, it's a it's a huge story. Uh, Phil Phil has sent the Martin Zero talk on the Guardian tunnels. Yeah, Martin Zero uh, is I believe a a guy that explores various parts of Manchester, and. Uh, He's a very brave guy. He goes into places I would be reluctant to go to, but I'm sure it's second nature for Phil because he likes going underground. Um, there's some extraordinary um, YouTube videos that Martin Zero has produced. Okay. And there we go. Right. Well, I think seeing as the questions are drying up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I think we've all enjoyed it. Oh, so, bless you. Thank and everybody you. else. Until next time. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, people. Bless you. Stay safe. Yeah, stay safe. All.